Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh So, let's move to the part 2 Introduction to the microfabrication Okay, so the, the first process that we're going to go through Is the oxidation to deposit the silicon oxide So, there are two parts of the oxidation The first one is the dry And the second one is the wet oxidation So, this is for silicon oxide Second one is the evaporation This is the additive process So, in the additive process We have what we call evaporation And also sputtering so, both are the additive process we are going to deposit the metal. So, the most simplest one is the evaporation. It can be done by E-beam or resistive PCT. Or another one is what we call sputtering. You need to bombard the ions in order for you to deposit the material. So, there are four types of the sputtering method. The first one is the CRF and the magnetron sputtering. And the both evaporation and the sputtering we call physical vapor deposition is uh, by vaporized the source and the other one what we call chemical vapor deposition so we need to use the chemical solution to deposit the material and the last one is the electro deposition so we see the advantage and the disadvantages of the evaporation and sputtering and what are the comparison between the CVD and the PVD so, at the additive process, first, as usual, we have the silicon substrate and we have two types of the additive uh, process, uh, additive or subceptive. Okay, first one is what we call surface micro -machining. So, for the surface, we didn't touch anything on the substrate. So, the substrate will remain as it is. So, what will be done is to add another layer on top of the substrate. And we're going to remove some layer below. So this is what we call cantilever from the side view. Okay. For the bulk micro where we're going to etch your substrate. So let's say your substrate here is silicon. So your device or your cantilever is coming from the substrate. So this area where the silicon has been etched, and you're going to add your T film on, on top. So the the chosen method, either bulk or surface, depends on the application. Okay, for the material part, so there are many materials that we use for the MIPS device. First one is the silicon oxide that used the oxidation before. So this is for the sacrificial layer or the masking material. And the second one is the polysilicon. Uh, is for the structural and the piezo resistive material. And the third one is the silicon nitrate is again for the structural material or we can have it for the protective layer for some application. And on top of that, we have zinc oxide. So this is a piezoelectric layer. So it also can use as the sacrificial material. The most important part here is your metal to make it uh, conductive, right? So we have aluminium, gold and platinum. So this is uh, three uh, most common material used for your electrode so it is a conductive electrode and the most important part for your photolithography is what we call photoresist so it is for mass material okay what are the difference between the structural sacrificial edge mass edge stop and protective first is the structural layer so this is where you're going to make your device. So this yellow one here is what we call structural layer. So it is a part of the device. Sacrificial means that we are going to remove it later. So we're going to deposit it to make uh, the device hanging. So let's say you're going to make a cantilever. So you need to make this part hanging, right? So you need to first add your sacrificial layer at the below. And then after you already deposit your cantilever beam, you're going to remove your sacrificial layer. So this, this is why it's called sacrificial layer to make the structure hanging such as the cantilever beam. And another one, we have a protection layer. So this protection is to protect from the entire chip during the packaging. And when we do edge, we need to stop somewhere, right? So there's also what we call edge stop layer. So usually the edge will put this inside a solution action solution so it knows where to stop where we're going to add a edge stop layer to make a, a membrane or a cavity and, and last one is the edge mask layer so in order to add layer to the substrate the first method for to add the silicon oxide 
there is what we call oxidation so what is actually oxidation we have a silicon it will re react with the oxide to create the ever first silicon oxide and second one is evaporation and sputtering so both is a physical vapor deposition uh, on top of that we have the chemical vapor deposition and the last one is uh, electro deposition okay let's go through the first uh, method that is what we call oxidation so the aim for this oxidation to to have a layer of silicon oxide so usually we have this for insulator layer so we start with the substrate and then you put the oxide layer on top so this oxide layer is a uh, uh, silicon oxide layer usually is uh, the thickness is very thin which is less than 100 nanometer or we can have a thick layer up to 1.5 micrometer so in order to do this you need a very uh, high temperature device that what we call for this and the device need to be operate uh, from 800 to 1200 degrees okay so this is the cross section of the furnace so we have a heating element to make it reach to 1000 degree and then you put your wafer in the middle and then you're going to uh, insert the oxygen or a water vapor on top of the substrate of the silicon and then it will uh, have outlet at the other side and the reaction will begin inside the chamber so oxidation can be either dry or wet so in order for you to have a dry oxidation, you just uh, put inside the chamber oxygen, the gas. So for the dry oxidation, you will give a very high quality silicon oxide. But it takes a very long time because the reaction is between the gas and the silicon. So the output will be SiO2. For the wet oxidation, you're going to put a water vapor that is H2O inside the chamber. So the reaction it will be quite fast, but it will have a lower quality oxide. So the reaction for the dry is silicon plus oxide it becomes silicon oxide. And you have wet oxidation is you react with the water vapor, and then you can get the silicon oxide with the byproduct of the hydrogen. So how can you know how thick is your oxide layer is? So it will be based on the color. So if we look at the color here, it's around like uh, red violet. So the thickness will be around 0 0.27 micrometer. So if it is brown, it's around 0 0.07 micrometer. So the thickness of the oxide layer depends on what? It depends on the source. It's either the water vapor or the oxygen gas. Uh, it also depends on the temperature. So either it's around 800 or 1000. And it depends on the time of the deposition. Okay, so let's see the simulation of the wet oxidation here. So for the wet oxidation, it's quite fast, but it creates a low quality oxide. But if you see the dry oxidation here, you re react with the oxygen and it will give a high quality oxide, but it takes a long time. Okay, so that's all for the oxidation part. Okay, so now let's move to the evaporation. So what is actually evaporation is one, one type of the physical vapor deposition. So why we call this one physical? Because the source, so in order for you to have a vapor deposition, you need a source. So your source must be a solid material. Uh, let's say it's a metal or the piezoelectric. So it must be a solid material. So that solid material will be vaporized and then condensed on your substrate to form a film. Okay, so there are two types of physical vapor deposition. The first one is evaporation, second one is the sputtering. So if we make an analogy how the PVD looks like, so we have a source and then you have a substrate at the end. So your source needs to be vaporized towards your substrate. So in, in terms of the MAPS device, your source needs to be in a solid material. So it will be vaporized and then it will be deposited on top of your substrate and it will form a thin film which is a very, the thickness will be very small. So let's say you have a, a mass here, so it will deposit only here and two sides. Okay, 
So in order to do that, you need a vacuum. Your your chamber need to be vacuum. So what does it mean by vacuum? Is a pressure less than the atmospheric pressure. So atmospheric pressure is seven hundred and sixty torr. But in order for you to have vacuum, it must be less than uh ten power of minus three torr. So it will take some time for you to have uh to make sure your chamber is in a vacuum position. So after your chamber has been in the vacuum position, the higher the pressure, the better it is. But it will take a long time. Okay, so the deposited layer can range from uh, one atom up to millimeter, depend on the structure. Okay. So why PVD needs a vacuum? What are the reasons? Okay, the first reason is you need to have a vapor out. So in order for you to have a vapor out, your source needs to be in the vacuum. So the vacuum uh, also helps the contaminants from being deposited. So after you have cleaned your substrate, you are going. Uh, you, the process will be uh, remove all the contaminants while depositing the tin tin film. So it also will reduce the particle density of the undesirable atoms. So it, when your your chamber is in vacuum, when you vaporize the source, it will reduce the undesirable atoms that will be deposited on the tin film. Okay, how are we going to create the vacuum? So we need pump. So there are many type of pumps. One is a rotary vane pump. So these are the pressure range for various vacuum regions. So usually, it goes up to type of minus three depend on the application. So we have another type of pump. There is a higher spec pump. There is turbo pump, diffusion pump, and syro, syro pump. So this pump can go uh, to high vacuum. And up to the ultra high high vacuum. So how we can set up the vacuum? So this is the process in the lab, okay. And uh, that's about the vacuum. So your PVD you have two part. One is what we call evaporation. So this evaporation usually we are going to deposit the metal. So remember just now is the conductive layer, right? So we have many type of metal. The source need to be such as aluminium, aurum, argentum, nickel, or titanium. So for this evaporation, you don't need to have a very high vacuum. Low pressure vacuum is enough for the evaporation. So in this process, the low melting point is melted. Uh, the source is melted and evaporated inside a vacuum, vacuum chamber. So for this evaporation, usually we do metal evaporation. So the, there are two types of the evaporation. The first one is thermal, the second one is EEB. Okay, how this evaporation works? So your source is at the below. So let's say this is your aluminium. So you need to make sure your chamber is in vacuum. So once you have a, a, a correct vacuum pressure after a, a few hours, and then you're going to start to de, uh, vaporize your source, and then it goes to your substrate. Okay. So what is the other requirement? So in order to do that, you need to, uh, to have the quite high temperature, around six hundred to one thousand uh, two hundred uh, degrees, and it can't be done by heavy metals. It's only a, a very simple metal. For this one, it can be it can be done by the evaporation. Okay. So there are two type of the evaporator. The first one is what we call by resistive heating. So means you are going to put heater at the below. And then we'll, we'll melt their source and then we'll be able uh, vaporized to your substrate. And the other one we we'll use E beam. This E beam you need to have electron source here. And we will give uh, the electron beam and then it will start to evaporate. So you need to have magnetic field here. So this is some example of the evaporants such as aurum and the rest. It comes in terms of a pellet or a powder here. So this one will be melted and we will vaporize. So this is the machine. And how we control the thickness? We use the quartz crystal micro balance. So this is one of the piezoelectric properties of the uh, uh, quartz is actually piezometrial. So it will send a signal and we control the, the thickness. Okay.